Welcome to Casual Friday. I have a project update on my Chipman's Block Mittens today, as well as a demonstration of how that thumb gusset worked. I talked a little bit about it last week and there were some questions about it. So I'm showing you how I'm doing it on the second mitten. Then I want to do a little follow up on some of the things I mentioned last week about tools and how they are sort of related to your knitting style and knitting personality. And I wanted to follow up with that because I had some comments on that too. Then I want to talk about F and W Media's Chapter 11 bankruptcy filing that occurred earlier this week. F and W Media owns Interweave Nets, among other various publications and publishing houses, and I write knitting articles for them. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And then I just thought it might be interesting for you to hear about the process of writing technical knitting articles, like how I got into that and what the sort of the whole process is for how that happens. I'll have links down in the description if you want to jump from section to section. So let's get started. So last week I showed you the first mitten that I had completed. This is a mitten called, it's called Chipman's Block Mittens. And it's actually, the original pattern was in a book called Flying Geese and Partridge Feet and written by a woman named Robin Hanson. And she had written another book that has something about fox and geese and fences, I think. And she wrote those back in the 80s. And then in about 20 years later, she decided to update and compile both books into one volume and updated the patterns. And so now the patterns are in favorite mittens. And I, I talked about this, oh, I don't know, was it a week or two ago? A couple of weeks ago, I talked about uh, Chipman's block mittens and how I had found a connection to my own family history in that particular pattern and which is why I wanted to knit them. But this particular book, these groups of books, the favorite mittens, flying geese and partridge feet and the fox and geese and fences books, they are they're they're com compilations of traditional or folk knitting um, mitten patterns from from Maine here in the United States and then from the coastal southeast coastal areas of Canada like Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, um, those places. What's interesting about these patterns is the way that the thumbs are created. Different knitting traditions have different styles of thumb gussets that work best for them. And this is one, this is a style, there's different variations on it within all of these mitten patterns, but they tend to, to do the increases in a very different way than I've seen before. So I wanna show you on my second mitten that I have in progress, show you how those increases are done. So here I'm in the process of knitting this second mitten and I've done some increase, I've done the first set of increases. So what we have this stitch pattern is we have two rows of what's called salt and pepper. So we're alternating light, dark, light, dark. So whatever's light on the first row is dark in the second row and vice versa. Then we have two rows of knit three, light knit three dark uh, operating. You see how the, the, the light stitches, the, they're centered over the light of the salt and pepper. So this first set of uh, salt and pepper is rows one and two, then we have three and four, and then rounds five and six is when we do the second set of salt and pepper. And again, they're centered over the center of the box. We have kind of this diamond shape here. And then what we do in the thumb, so we had three dark, three light, three dark, when we get to the salt and pepper section, when we ha get to this first light stitch, we're going to work it with as in salt and pepper, but we're going to be working it with, with both colors at the same time to increase it from one stitch to two. And then we work the center stitch, and then we work this stitch with both colors. So that increases this by two stitches, and then on the next round, when we get to that double stitch, each of those is worked with both colors. 
and then the center stitch is worked and then we work each of the other two that were increased before uh, with both colors. So now we've increased four more. We've increased a total of six, which is a full repeat. So rather than having a light here and then above it a dark, what we've done here over, over this particular block, we've increased by six stitches. So we've increased these three stitches into nine stitches. And what that does is create a new blue one, dark blue on each side of here, and we get the light blue stacked on top of it. But now I've just worked a dark blue block, and now I'm ready to do my second set of increases. So I'm gonna show you how that works once I get across. So the other thing I mentioned last week was that I was working this inside out because I'm working in magic loop, so when you get to the end of a needle here, like right here, I've got three dark blue and then three light blue, and then I need to move to the next needle and work three dark blue and then the three light blue. So you get this kind of long strand here. Well, if you're working one half of the round to the other half, what can happen right here from one of these light blues to the next is you can end up cutting this corner. What I do in, uh, when I'm working magic loop, rather than working with the right side out, you see how the yarn is attached to this back needle and I'm about, I am about ready to start working on this front needle. So I need to pull this one out so I can uh, work across this needle. What I do is I turn this inside out like this. And now you'll see that the, that the working yarn is attached to the front here but I still want to work from this needle to that. So now I'm gonna be working across the back needle. When you turn it inside out, you still work on the same needle. You're still working in the same direction, but the perspective of where you're working from is different. So I'm going to be working across here. I work with one yarn in each hand. So I've chosen to have the dark be a dominant and the light be the background color. So I keep the dark yarn in my left hand and I knit with the light yarn in my right hand. That keeps the floats parallel. I've done a whole series of videos on this. So I'm getting ready to start salt and pepper. And remember with these blocks of stitches, I want uh, the middle stitch to be the same color as this block. So I'm gonna start with a light, dark light here. Okay, so the center is where I'm working these, the center of the thumb gusset is where I'm working these increases. So I'm about ready to work them. So I need to work this stitch with both colors. So I enter, I'm gonna wrap with the light color, then wrap with the dark and pull them both through. So I keep them in the right order. So that's the light and the dark. Then I'm gonna work the center stitch in pattern with just the light. And now I'm gonna work this last dark stitch again in order, but this time dark light. So I wrap with the dark first and then the light and pull them both through. And so I still have maintained the pattern with light, dark, light, dark, but I increased by two stitches. So then I continue in pattern. I've got a dark light, so now it's time for a dark light. And then I'll continue until I get back around to this half of the round. So I'm getting ready to start the half of the round where the thumb gusset is. And so I've, I've got this one round of salt and pepper and I've just finished a needle here. What I wanted to show you was that um, by having this inside out, when I strand the yarn from one of these stitches around to here, it causes the yarn to have to wrap around the outside that I don't cut the corners at all. So right here, I need, if it's light, I need to knit it dark, dark, I need to knit it light. It's sort of the color version of seed stitch. Okay, so I'm approaching these double stitches here. You can, can kind of see I have a double stitch and a double stitch. So I'm gonna continue alternating. So this is a light. And now I'm going to uh, work this light stitch, but I need to work it uh, with both colors and in order. So I just worked a light. So I come in, I wanna do a dark first and the light around, pull it through. 
and then I work the next one in the same way. I need to work it as a dark and a light. Now I need to, to work that center stitch just as a dark. And now I need to work this as a light dark. Let's see if I got that in there. And then the next one also as a light dark. Oops. Get that over. There. And then I can continue working just in patterns. So I've just increased four more stitches, so I've increased a total of six altogether. So last week when I was talking about how knitting style can affect your choice of techniques as well as your personality can influence those choices as well. And I, so I talked a little bit about how I came to knit the way that I knit and how my first knitting method affected my second knitting method and then how my choice of tools is sort of based on um, preferences that I have and and the result being that I knit almost everything on a 32 inch circular needle whether I'm knitting flat or in the round whether I'm knitting small circumference or large circumference and as I showed you when I was demonstrating knitting inside out to do that thumb I knit small circumference stranded collar work items using magic loop inside out so that I can avoid those short floats. And someone mentioned in the comments last week, oh, well, you can do that with uh, two circulars. You can avoid having to turn something inside out and you can avoid having those short floats at the corners with the two circulars method. So it is true that you can use the two circulars method rather than knitting inside out in order to avoid short floats. And and I think it's worth trying that out. Like if you're in a position where you're working small circumference items in the round and you want to do stranded collar work, there are a variety of ways of you that you can do that. You can do that with one circular, with two circulars. You could do it with a nine inch circular if you can stand to use those. Uh, you can do them with flexi flips. You can do them with all sorts of different tools. So the combination of tool combined with the technique that you're using, strand and color work combined with the project that you're knitting, something like a sock or a mitten, will determine what your preference is when it comes to selecting your tools. And for me, since there's always multiple ways of getting to the same endpoint, I take a look at the combination of, of things that, that's going to give me um, the most pleasure while I'm knitting. And so for me, it's always going to be using one needle, almost always going to be using one needle rather than using two. So I don't mind working inside out. Uh, I'd much rather do that than using two circulars, but you, may feel differently. Somebody else mentioned in the comments, well, you, you didn't mention nine inch circulars or flexi flips and, and those can be really great for working small circumference items. So I did mention nine inch circulars and flexi flips while I was recording and then I ended up editing that portion out because what I did mention and leave in was that I dislike 16 inch circular needles because the tips are so short. So nine inch circulars and flexi flips have even shorter tips and because of my particular knitting style, I need at least a five inch tip, otherwise I'm uncomfortable when I knit. Lots of people love nine inch circulars, lots of people love flexi flips. So I did try them out last year just to see what I would feel about them. I had a feeling that I wouldn't like them, but I, I, I don't like to say that I know for certain how I'm going to feel about a particular technique or tool until I actually try it. Because in the, in the past, I've looked at things like certain types of projects or certain types of tools, and I've said, well, those are ridiculous. Why would anybody do that? And then I realized that's really an intellectually dishonest thing to do is to have an opinion about something that you actually have no experience with. So I bought a set of flexi flips last year and I did a review on them. I really uh, kept out my personal opinion about whether or not I would use them because I don't think that that is necessarily important. Um, rather I would explain what the advantages and disadvantages are and then you as a knitter knowing yourself and what your preferences are can 
can decide if that's something that might work for you and that you might want to try out. I had a request in the comments last week to talk in a, in a casual Friday about finding new tools that, that maybe you don't know about. And so I can tell you what I tend to do, because as I've mentioned, I tend to minimize the, the, the number of tools that I have and I, write, I like to switch the technique I use rather than switch my tool because that's my preference. But sometimes I am buying new tools and sometimes it's simply because it's so new and different, I have no idea whether I'm gonna like it or not. Like the flexi flips, I thought, well, that's a really interesting idea. I don't think I'm gonna like them because I imagine the tips are gonna be too short for me, but I want to try them and see what they're like. And so I try them out. Other times I need a new tool either because I'm traveling and I haven't brought the right size with me or it might be a really unusual, say a really unusual needle size that I don't already have. A couple of years ago, I was uh, working on a design for something and I wanted to try a seven millimeter needle and a seven and a half millimeter needle. Now, these are not needle sizes that have an, a standard US equivalent. They sort of do, a seven millimeter is considered a 10 and three quarters and a seven and a half is considered a 10 and seven eighths needle. These are not sort of standard in American needle manufacturers. There are only a few companies that sell them here in the United States that I know of. It could be there are more now, but at the time there were, it was really limited. And I had heard about Chalgo needles. And so I thought, well, this is an opportunity to try them because if I really hate them, it doesn't matter because this is a needle size I haven't ever used prior and may not use much in the future, but it will give me some information about this type of needle that I don't already have. So I ordered needles in those sizes, from fixed length of Chiaogu, and I really liked them. I liked the pointiness of the tips. I liked the slickness of the metal. I really liked the cable. As I mentioned last week, when I was first buying circular needles a number of years ago, there weren't very many options for needles that had flexible cables, but now pretty much any new needle, needle that's coming on the market uh, does have a nice cable, a nice flexible cable that, that allows you to use it in any with any sort of technique. So I liked those Chalgo needles, and then I ended up buying one, I was missing a, a US2, I think. I had one needle in a US2, a circular needle that had been made from uh, laminate wood that I tried out because I normally like metal, but I thought, well, I'm gonna try this laminated wood and I ended up stepping on it and breaking it. So I hadn't had a size two needle for a couple of years. I hadn't needed one until I started knitting socks for my brother. I'm using a little bit thicker sock yarn for him, so I'm using a larger needle. So I, again, I ordered the Chao Gu uh, fixed length uh, circular needle in a size two. It has the, these red cables. Uh, I think they're, I don't know if they're called red lace or twist. I'm not sure what they're called, but they're these red, well, it's like this. They're like these red uh, needles with a, a red cable on them. And it has a nice flexible cable to it. I really, I really like it. So as I was uh, thinking about this in the past couple of weeks, I was reflecting on how I don't actually like my knit picks interchangeables as much as I used to. Because when I first got them, the cable seemed really nice and flexible compared to what other needles I, I could find. And lately I've been thinking, geez, have they gotten stiffer? Like have they gotten brittle with age? Or is it just that relative to what I'm able to get now, they're not as nice because my signature needles have these amazing cables to them. And then I like the Chowgu cables as well. So I think it was a comparison thing. So sometimes that's how I sort of gravitate to something else. So I ended up buying a new set of interchangeables for the Chowgus and it's, they come in different uh, ranges of sizes. You can get a small, the small set, which means small meaning US2, which is a 2.75 millimeter up to a US8. So that's the small set. And those are the size needles I use the most. So I bought a set of those and they came with three different lengths of cables and then a nice case. And I like them. So I think that over time, I will probably start using my knit picks less often just because uh, I have the option of using the chow goods. But that's kind of how I end up falling into tools. 
Sometimes though, I'll hear about something or I'll have a need for something and I really don't know much about it. And so what I will do is I will go on to one of the Ravelry, one of the main forums they have. They have, it's called the big six, but I think there's seven forums now of the main forums that everybody gets. And one of them is called tools and equipment. And so I'll go on there and I'll look to see uh, what does, uh, what do people think about this type of needle or that type of needle or, or are there any reviews on this or, you know, just to, to find out what these things are or what people think of them. Uh, so that's one way I do it. What I, what I would recommend staying away from is if somebody tells you, like I've told you why I like these chow goo needles, but I'm not telling you, I think you should buy them because I don't know if you should buy them. I'm telling you what I, what it is I like about them, why I bought the ones that I bought, but I, I can't tell you if that's something that you should buy. So in this tools and equipment form, a lot of times you'll see people, usually they're newer knitters who are saying, I don't know if I should buy an interchangeable set and I don't know which set I should buy. And everybody's got an opinion. Well, I like this one. I hate that one. And that is not the question <laughs> that needs to be answered is not what is the specific brand or type of needle that this pr particular person that we don't know, what do, should they buy? Instead, I think newer knitters in particular need to explore and they need to explore different types of projects, different types of techniques, different types of yarn and different yarn weights and different yarn constructions and they need to explore different types of needles. Because even if you like a particular needle just fine, you think, well, this works just fine, that doesn't mean you aren't gonna like something else better. And it's, it's really a good idea to try a lot of different things because as a new knitter, you're going to need new needles every time you have to buy, uh, every time you start a new project, just about. And that can start to drive you crazy and you wanna solve the problem by, well, let me just buy a full set of needles, what should I buy? but you don't really have enough information yet about what you really like, plus your tastes are gonna change. So what I would recommend is that if you need a, a, to buy a size four needle, then you, and you haven't tried wood before, or you haven't tried bamboo, or you haven't tried metal, you haven't tried something with a pointy tip or a blunt tip, if you don't know, um, try one of those and see how you like it. And maybe you like it just fine, um, try something else the next time because you might find some, find out that you like something even better. I remember when I ordered my uh, signature needles in the circulars, I really liked my straights and I bought the circulars because I knew I was going to like the tips. I knew I was going to like um, the metal aspect of them. Turned out they had a swivel, like the tips would swivel so that the cables don't get twisted up. I had never seen that in, an, in a needle. I never knew that I would want that in a needle and it turns out that I love it. Now I don't require it in a needle, but it's something that I really like. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't tried that needle. So I would recommend just trying a lot of different things and seeing what you like. And with the interchangeable sets these days, it's so easy, you don't have to buy a whole set. You can buy a couple of tips and a couple of cables, say you like them, try something else, see how you like those. And a lot of companies, uh, if they have multiple different types of interchangeable needle tips, a lot of times those cables are exchangeable with each other. And so you can create a full set, um, maybe with a certain size you really prefer bamboo and another size you really prefer metal, it really could vary. That's my advice when it comes to seeking out tools and how to approach buying something new. This week, FNW Media, which is the parent company of Interweave, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. F&W Media started back in, I think it was 1913, 1914, something like this. It was a family owned business for I think three generations. And they originally started with two publications. I think it was called Farm Worker was the F, and then W is Writer's Digest. When I was writing fiction, I had a library full of books from Writer's Digest. So I'm very familiar with them. But 60% of the publications that they own these days are craft books and that craft pub publishers, and that includes Interweave. So Interweave has uh, books that they publish. Uh, I probably have a ton of books up, up here that are published by Interweave. And they also publish magazines, Interweave Knits, Interweave Knitwear, Interweave Knit Scene. 
they do interweave crochet, they do spin off for spinners. Um, F and do I don't know if beadwork is one of of um, interweaves publications, but it is one of F and W's publications. They also have photography magazines and woodworking magazines, all kinds of things. So it's a huge deal in publishing that this one company is, to, is filing for bankruptcy. So in the United States, a person or a company files for bankruptcy in order to get protection from its creditors. That means their creditors can't keep coming after them uh, while this process is going on. And so the assets are evaluated. And in this case, Chapter 11 is, uh, allows for the company to do some restructuring and reorganization in order for it to become profitable again. And then at some point there may be a deal where the creditors get some percentage of whatever they were originally owed. I, I, I don't know all of how all of that works. So, and then there's some point where a company says, there's no point going on and we just have to liquidate. And at that point, everything would get sold off. All their assets would get sold off. And then whatever the assets are, then the creditors are sort of prioritized and then there's some determination about what percentage of what they're owed they're actually going to get. What, what happened with F&W was that the family that had owned the business sold it, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago to some kind of investment group that was interested in, in media. And they were seeing that print was sort of de in decline, print media was in decline. So what they thought they would do is buy up these niche publications for people who are interested in spe specific hobbies or collectibles or something like that. And then where the money would be, would be in selling them products that they would want to use in conjunction with whatever their interest was. So they were gonna go into e-commerce. The problem was they didn't really know anything about e-commerce and they, they really uh, made a mess of it and, and went into huge amounts of debt. And I believe they continued to buy more publications and then they would eliminate half the staff and then they would use whatever the profits were from those publications in order to try to pay off the debt from their e-commerce endeavors, which ultimately didn't work. So in January of 2018, the board of F&W fired the CEO, the COO, and one other executive. And then they hired somebody new, who worked at trying to reorganize and restructure, and things turned around a little bit, but, but they decided to be, in January of this year that they were gonna be out of money at the end of March. And so they would have to file for chapter 11 bankruptcy. And so the goal, it sounds like at this point, is to sell off the different publishing companies that they own to other parties. And because I think the, the publishing companies are, are okay, it's that F&W Media has a problem because of the e-commerce debt that they have, have accumulated. So this is kind of a big deal for anybody who's into knitting or yarn related crafts because interweave is a big part of that world for both patterns and books and, and all sorts of things. So, but and it's kind of a big deal for me because I write articles for interweave and I wasn't sure what to do. I have four articles due in the next couple of months and I wasn't sure what to do about it. So I contacted my technical editor at uh, Interweave and said, you know, what should I do? And she said, well, everything that's scheduled is scheduled to, you know, that's already, that was already planned is in, in the works. We're just going forward with it. And um, anything that is invoiced after the, um, the filing anything that's invoiced after that is there's they're legally obligated to pay that in full so it's so anything that's owed to people um, previously is sort of on hold right now until everything gets sorted out but anything that they get invoiced for after that point they're supposed to pay for <laughs> whether they'll be able to or not I don't know for me when I have to write an article, I'm also usually thinking about how can I turn these ideas into a video. And likewise, when I make videos, I, I often think, how would this make a good article? So I don't typically 
create uh, one without thinking about is it possible to turn this into the other thing. Now I make a lot more videos than I, than I write articles. So typically it's how can I turn this article into a video, but often my articles are based on videos I've already done in the past. So for me, I'm not worried about uh, losing my copyright, losing my words. I'm not wasting my effort by thinking through uh, the content that's going into these articles. So I plan on finishing these articles, turning them in, and hoping that the issues will, will be published, that, that Interweave will get purchased by somebody and we'll be able to continue going forward. So we'll find out. I thought in, in light of all this, I thought, you know, this might be interesting for you to learn about how I even got involved in writing uh, articles for Interweave and then just kind of how that process works. When the shop where I used to teach uh, was closing down, so I wouldn't be teaching there anymore, I had to not only find where am I going to buy my yarn from now on, but I also had to think about what am I going to do about teaching? Because I really enjoy teaching. But I, I didn't know if I wanted to continue teaching in a yarn shop situation. Did I want to try to do na teaching nationally? Did I want to write articles? What did I want to do? And, and at the time I decided, okay, I want to do YouTube videos. There's so much work involved in getting back into that because I had done it sort of really sporadically over the years and I hadn't done it at all for two years. So I needed to relearn how to even make a, a knitting video, how to do that. I had, and, and because I was doing it every week, I wanted to improve the quality of the lighting and the sound and, and how I was doing the demonstrations and, and just thinking through like, how long should the videos be? How do I organize the content? So I was really focused on that. Plus I had to get better at editing videos, just like learning how to edit them took a while. So I looked at submitting to magazines and I thought, oh, I just, I don't want to do this right now. So when the magazine is, is thinking about an issue, usually they're planning a year ahead of time. They think about what they want in terms of the sweater patterns or the accessory patterns or whatever, because each magazine kind of is geared toward a different audience. And so they, they think about the colors, the sort of the theme or the, the feelings that they want to evoke, well, you know, for that issue. And then they put a call out for design submissions. So you can get on email lists from different publishers um, when they are putting a call out for, for new designs, if you are a knitwear designer. So like Knitty, is an online magazine and you can find out about those and you'd get an email uh, being alerted for what they want. Some magazine publishers and maybe even some book collections, like if someone's putting together a collection of patterns for a book, they'll put a call out in the designers group on Ravelry and then they'll have all the information about what it is they're looking for, how to submit, um, all that kind of thing. And typically for design, like a, a knitting design, you'd You'd write a sketch, you draw a sketch out, and then you do a swatch of the stitch pattern, and you combine that all together um, in a package that you then physically mail to their offices. So they don't want you to send them email inquiries on this. They're very specific. You, this is what you need to do, and then you, you ship it all to our offices. So for articles, though, um, it's, it's similar, but, but a little different. It was at some point, I was probably three, four months into uh, doing weekly YouTube videos when I was contacted on Ravelry directly and asked if I would like to write freelance technical knitting articles for internet, for not internet, for Interweave. So then I started corresponding by email with this technical editor and asking, well, yeah, I guess I'd like to do that. And she said, well, what would you like to write? And so I'm like, oh, well, can you give me some ideas of what, you, what you've had in your magazine for the past couple of years that you thought were pretty good? Because I didn't want to repeat ideas. I wanted to kind of see how the different magazines presented things. I, I just didn't know enough about um, the different magazines and, and the articles that they had published. So she sent me a whole box of magazines with uh, little post-it notes on those pages where those articles were. And, and I looked those over for a day or two. And then I came up with a list of like 
eight or 10 different ideas. One of them for sure was something I'd done a video on like a month or so earlier. And I said, I don't know if that matters to you. And they said, not at all. So the way it worked at first was they asked me, well, what would you like to write about? And I gave them a list and then they chose a couple. And then a few months later, they asked for a couple more articles from that list. And then going forward after that, it's kind of been a combination of things. Sometimes the, uh, because the design ideas are submitted ahead of time, you know, they need more lead time in order to choose those like sweater designs or whatever the, the garments are going to be for that issue. And they kind of see what they have. And so sometimes they'll see, oh, we've got uh, several different sweaters in this issue that ha that combine stranded color work with a solid stockinette how would you be interested in writing an article on that transition you know because you might need to change a needle size so like oh sure i can write an article on that and then there was another time when they said well we've got the summer issue has got several different sweaters with lace patterns in them would you like to write an article on fixing lace mistakes so i said sure i'll do that and, um, and once in a while, it's like, oh, we have, we have a couple of garments that have this kind of feature. Would you like to write an article on that? And I was like, no, <laughs> no, I don't. But if that's an article you want, I wouldn't be offended if somebody else wrote it. So, so there's this kind of back and forth. And, or sometimes I'll give them a list of ideas and like, oh, we like these two. And this third one is interesting, but could you do it this way instead? And so there's just some collaboration going on. So because they approached me, I didn't and don't have to submit ideas through snail mail. So that's something that an unknown would have to do. Like if they didn't know you at all and you wanted to write an article, you wouldn't email them. You would submit just like they do, like the designers do. I'm sure, I don't know this for, for certain, but I will bet you anything that when a really big name knit designer appears in one of their magazines, it's because they have approached that designer, not because the designer has put together a package and, and sent it through the mail. So I think once they know you, it's like anything in, in business or, or life, when you know somebody that can do something that you want, then you can contact them a different way than when you don't know them at all. So that's how I started writing for them and then how I pitch my ideas to them. So typically what happens after that is we talk about how, sometimes they tell me how long they want the article to be and other times they ask me how long is it going to be? And I have to think about, cause I could fill any number of words they gave me, I could write about it. <laughs> so I typically have to try to figure out what's the minimum I could do and get everything packed in there. So, Usually the articles, the, the smallest article I've written has been about a thousand words and the biggest has been 1500. And then there's always pictures and things. And so I write the article and I might write up some charts or I might have some photographs. And sometimes the photographs, you just can't show in a photograph what's supposed to be going on. And so then they'll have one of the graphic designers do one of those kind of line drawings that can, so you can really see what part of the stitch is is happening and uh, but typically what happens is i knit up swatches if i if i'm going to have to knit up some fairly large number of swatches or fairly substantial size uh, i will ask them i always ask them what colors they want because like i want to fit in with their color scheme and uh, often they'll send me yarn to go with it or they'll say well here are the colors that would work for this issue pick something that you like you know so it's like usually a combination of i'll send you something or pick something from the from these colors that you would like to, like to use and then they ship it to me and i use that for the swatches and then if i want to make a point in a photograph or a drawing or a chart or something like that, I indicate that in the article. And then if it's a photograph, I photograph my swatch myself in the position and then kind of show them what I want them to, to do. And then they, but they do all of the artwork. They do all of the photography again. So I have to ship them my swatches and then they re-photograph them based on what I'm telling them I want to be shown. So that's kind of how that works. So in January, they were contacting me about articles 
that would be appearing in fall, winter, or holiday issues of various interweave publications. So that's how far ahead they're planning for my articles, but for the actual designs, they put out a call for submission earlier than that. It's a long process, and so uh, so we'll see. What One of the things I read online was that there was some sort of sale pending for closing at the end of May and another for June. It's not clear for which publications or if it, that means all of them or w what's in store. So my hope is that Interweave and all of its publications will be able to live on in the future and that I will be able to be part of that. We'll see. So I'll leave, I'll leave some links down in the description to some articles about the bankruptcy that you might find interesting. And uh, my hope is that they will get purchased by somebody and you know, we will continue on for many, many years to come. That's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.